started. Yeah. So I'd like to welcome you all to this fifth Speech New Zealand workshop. And one of the things that you put down on the survey last year that you would like to learn a bit more about was poetry and the teaching of poetry for exams. And today we're very lucky to have Pauline Prendergast, who's the chair of the Board of Trustees, and Pam Logan, who is an ex-chair of the Board of Trustees, but still a trustee, to give us this workshop on poetry, which I'm sure we're all going to enjoy. So over to Pauline and Pam, the P team. Thank you, Helen. Thank you so much. And welcome to everybody. I know that probably during this workshop, we will try and garner the information and expertise of all of you, because I'm sure you will all have something to offer about teaching poetry. And I've noticed in the time of examining and teaching that lots of students have difficulties with free verse, particularly the suspensory pause, and also with the sonnet form. I do find that several uh, students I've examined just don't have much idea of the form of the sonnet, how to approach that. So we thought we'd look at that tonight. So first of all, I'm going to look at tips for juniors. And then I'll look at the sonnet form. And then we'll look at free verse. And at times we'll put you into breakout rooms and it'll be time for discussion and inputs of your ideas on poetry speaking. So can you bring up the first slide, please, Emma? A hiatus. <laughs> can everybody see that? Yes. Uh, yeah. And this is just a quote by Sir Philip Sidney, who was the 15th century great poet. And I think it still speaks to us today. Poetry is a speaking picture with this end, to teach and to delight. Thank you, Emma. I'll have the next slide, please. So first of all, going to look at juniors. And it's really important that they have fun with words because this helps them to bring the poem to life. And it's really important for them to enjoy the poems. And the way that they can do that I have found for this, them to be physically and imaginatively involved. If they can move and act out the poems, uh, then it really helps them to bring those words to life. So if, if they can explore physically the sound of the words, they can use their hands to begin with, to explore the words, and then full body movement. A lot of you have probably experienced and taught verbal dynamics where you bring the words to life particularly words that onomatopoeic, words, for example, like smash and pop and kapow, and all those words can uh, onomatopoeic, and you can use those to help them to explore the sound of words. And often there are those sort of words in their poems, and if they can act them out and use their full body movement while they're practicing, then that helps them to bring the poems to life. We'll go on to the next slide, please, Emma. So Pam, I'll ask you to work with this one, please. Right, so this is a, I, I just thought it would be quite fun to do something. Um, we With so many people, it's a bit, bit hard to um, get everybody involved, but we are going to break out into groups in a minute or two. And we're going to have a look at this little poem called Bug Words, which I use quite often with some of my my junior students, particularly when they're, when they're uh, feeling new. Yeah. Um, sorry, did somebody have a all right um particularly when they're fairly new okay. and what i like to do is I mean, I in our terms where That's in the back. we're all exploring this we're exploring the substance of the word and it's a word i've used sometimes when i'm examining and it's the way that the the feel of the word in the gymnasium of the mouth if you like so if you look at this little poem it's humbug it's not just humbug. It's, you know, you can really use all the sounds in the word. Um, and kids really love exploring this one. So, you know, we get a humbug, bug bear, bug a boot, you know, they can do all sorts of things with it. So I'd like you to go into, into groups. Get muted. Sorry, where do I need to go back to? Anybody? Are we all right? Okay, you're good. Sorry, that was my fault. You just said Sorry. you wanted everyone to go into groups. 
Uh, yes, I, I do in a minute. Um, but what we'll do is just explore that poem. Just in, We'll only have five minutes in the group anyway, so it's a little bit of time to chat, a little bit of time to explore that poem and see how you can you go with doing those words and finding your way around those words. And while you're doing it, you might want to just reflect on, um, you know, what you might have um, thought about this, from doing it for yourself, or what you might expect your students to discover in doing it. And perhaps I think when I get students to, to present this, I, I'm also looking at some drama things in, in terms of how do they start? How do they finish when they're working together in a group? So you've got all those things coming to coming together that you can you can focus on depending on the group and what they need. So if we could all, Emma's going to put you into groups of Four, I think. Did you say? Did we say, Emma? Um, okay. So, how did that go? It's really hard when you're all in separate little little head spaces. I, I imagine to do this. But does anybody want to sort of just kick off with a bit of reflection on how that went? Okay, I will if you like. Yep. Right. We talked uh, with Naresh and Gabrielle, the three of us. Yes. And uh, talked about the all the different aspects of modulation that you can address with this poem, like volume, um, all the, the articulation, for, for instance, yes. and um, how perhaps also to include movement mm -hmm. and make it playful, especially for little ones. I can mm -hmm. just see them buzzing around the room as bugs. And oh, absolutely. It's using a, one of the words and repeating that and doing things with it. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So, uh, what I uh, did you feel the substance of the word, the actual, you know, like humbug, bug absolutely, bear, you know, yeah, like yeah, inside the body, not just humbug, bug bear. You know, there's mm. a big difference. Oh yeah. 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 Somebody else got anything to add? Thank you, Denny. Nobody. Did anybody feel it helped in any way to bring the words to life with doing the exercises and with doing the movement? They wouldn't have had much chance to do any movement. We did. Sorry, Melda? We did variations of pitch. Right. Yes, yes. you could do that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we must be all. I haven't ever done it. I, I have never done that thinking about modulation in particular. I just, right. you know, let's go for it. Let's open up our voices and see what we can do with the voices. Mm. It's perhaps been my approach to that. Other things I might have used for, for modulation. So thanks. I might try that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Kerry, Kerry, were you going to say something? I was, and I realised I was muted. But <laughs> I'm talking about honesty program in my classes this afternoon. Yes. Yeah. Done for the homework. Have you done the homework? So I'm going to be honest and say we had a really great conversation, but we didn't actually get to the poem. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that might be an advantage it. too. I hope you discuss some interesting, interesting things. <laughs> but you, yeah, can and I, you can encourage them to do a lot of movement to those, to like a different movement to each word as yeah, well, yeah. which helps them to bring it to life too. Did anybody try that? Can't try really do it in those groups. To I try movement. No, you didn't no. try movement. We talked about it. We, we did. Didn't. We did. We talked yeah. about stamping and moving. Very strongly. Good. Very good. And did it help the sound of the words? Yes, it helps yes. the formation of the words. Absolutely. Without them even thinking about it, particularly. Oh. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's a really good bonus when that happens. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Good. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. We'll move on now to slide four, please, Emma. So the next one. Hold on. Sorry, let me just move you back to one screen here. Cool. Okay. Is that the right one? Yeah, yes, thank you. The suspensory pause, which I know so many students do have a lot of trouble with, and it is quite difficult. Uh, so just to go over it, because a lot of you will know this, uh, when speaking, lengthen the last syllable of the line. That usually helps them to just hold that vowel sound out, particularly in the last word on the line. And using a rising inflection to lead into the next line. And do not take a breath. It's like a little catch in the voice almost uh, for you to carry on to the next line to keep the sense going. 
So now we'll have a look at Vampire Duck and Pam will take you through this. Well, this is just one that I found when I was working with some students one time. And I thought, what can I do just to get that, take it off the poems that they were actually working on and just look at how the suspensory pause um, happened. So we try, started talking about what suspense, what do we do? You know, we hold things up before we move into the next thing. Um, and if you look at this, when you get to keep away from the pond at midnight, or the feathery friend will attack. They can play around with that so that they're actually keeping you up in suspense to find out what's going to happen next. And while that doesn't always apply with all poems, it certainly works in this and it's one you can play with a wee bit with, with students and I find it, it works quite well. Um, and then the, the other poem is Fire, which is on that um, the sheet of poems. Could you bring that up please? Um, sheet of poems it's got one it's a little poem called fire and it has a line on it that goes something like um it's talking about fire as a dragon and it I, does all sorts of things it's the one right on the um right hand got, haven't got that pardon i haven't got fire have you not it's on right on the right hand side can the you see it on the screen now Melda? Oh, Some I see. There we go. Right, yep. fire is a dragon. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then in the second verse, it's got a, it's got a lot of suspensory pauses in it. But there's a little one there where it said spark. It talks about sending up sparks into the sky that hover a moment and suddenly die. And I think that's one that you can use a lot. Um, you know, that hover a moment. They can, their hands can go up, hover a moment and suddenly die. So you get the feeling of the movement of the sparks and remind them about a bonfire or something like, you know, there's a bit of discussion around bonfire day or, or something. Yeah. If they have bonfires nowadays, probably don't. Um, but I think those are a couple of poems that I've used to actually, shall I say, point the, really base the, the class on suspensory pauses and what it does. So you're not necessarily working on a poem they might be doing for an exam or something you just you're just helping them find um techniques for themselves I've, has anybody got any questions about suspensory pauses i've it's not a question but it was something i found was quite useful and i was wanting yeah. to get the image of what happens yeah and i said to them in those days i used to say it's like a runner carpet down the stairs goes along and then over to the next and, <laughs> That's a good idea. and then yeah. when i thought people don't have carpets on these stairs it's like a little waterfall going down and you yeah. know it's there but it keeps on flowing yes so it yeah. marks a movement yeah and draws yeah. So attention to it of a kind it's mm. finding that imagery isn't it mm. Mm. i i do remember talking with the dear, dear Mar Narissa Moore about dispensary pauses. She said, oh, but you can take a breath. I said, well, yes, but in general, you don't take a breath. You try and, you know, um, well, I, I certainly try and get students not to take a breath. But obviously, if you've got a poem that's um, a free verse and it's got no punctuation, you're going to have to take a breath somewhere, aren't you? <laughs> you can't, can't avoid it altogether. Yeah. Can I say something, Pam? Yeah. Um, yeah. Just that, that little pause for me in a suspensory pause mm -hmm. to show the shape of the poem I yeah. think is really important and I often say to students when they're saying a poem um, that even though we know to keep to keep the to keep the flow yeah. if I close my eyes I should be able to actually see the shape of the poem when you're speaking That's and and you you can mm. um, by what they do and mm -hmm. so, and the pause, you know, the use of pause and pausation. And so um, that pause, I still think, even though it's small and it's little, it's yeah. not too Sometimes long. Sometimes it's very small. Yes, it is. It, mm -hmm. It's there. And it has to be there, I believe, to show that shape. Absolutely. Absolutely. And often I find too, when you're looking at the sense of the whole poem, if they get that pause, it actually leads them into the beginning of the next line and you get a really, uh, you get the emphasis comes on the beginning of the next line, which often it does in Shakespeare anyway. Yeah, it does. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Anything else on that? No? Somebody, Naresh, did you want to ask a question or say something? 
Uh, no, um, it's really lovely and interesting listening to you. And uh, no, no, thank you. But there's a little hand on your, on your. Oh no, that's my um, it's my mouse. That's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> like a hand against yours, that made me think you'd you'd um, because there's a little hand module you can use sometimes. Okay, we want to just have a um, a quick look at strange ways, and then we're ready to go on to the sonnets. So yes, strange ways is back on that other. Thing we want slide, please. Uh, we'll just go to the next slide. We'll just go to the Come next on. slide first, Anne, cool. I think. Thank you. Slide six. Yeah. Next one. This this one. Yeah, next one. All right. So this is strange way. You can talk about this, Pam. Uh yeah. Well, strange ways is a poem that I. It's another one I like to use with students just to get the feeling of poems and um and it's about. I use this to explore different points of view in a poem, because sometimes you can say, who's talking in a poem? To who are they talking and why? And that sort of gives a whole new light to a, to a poem. And this is one that you can, I've, you know, we've had a grumpy neighbor or a gossipy neighbor or a, a TV reporter or something. So if we could just have the next, or the, the poem up, please. No, sorry, it's, it's on the sheet of poems. It's on the sheet of poems, yeah. Okay. Um, it's not the junior ones, is it? Yeah, yes. 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 already had. Yeah. Back to the juniors. One second. Have you got it? Have you got it there? That's it. Yep, that's it. Right there, it's on the left. Yep. So, um, Granny's canaries escape from its cage, and you know, you, it's like somebody's standing on the side talking about this. You know, she's escaped from a cage. Why has she escaped from a cage? Well, she's in a terrible rage. So you can you can do lots of things with. Um, playing games with this i think which is what makes it fun um and you could have somebody be you know you could act it out and have somebody being a canary if you like and some of the next door neighbors and you could have granny and you could do all sorts of things but usually i've just done it from who's talking in the poem and who are they talking to and maybe it's a um um it's a it's a neighbor or maybe it's a, a tv reporter reporting on it or, or asking questions of somebody out on the street who's watching this canary up there um and it's also interesting to look back at that poem because it's written about strange ways prison in england and there was a um uh -huh, what's the word i want it's gone a, a riot in the prison and the, and the prisoners locked themselves up on, on the roof with placards and then, then Roger McGuff wrote this poem. So you can you can take it to a little bit more depth if you've got students who are ready for that. Yeah. So I think I won't go on any more about that, but it's just a, a useful little poem to explore. It's a fun, a fun poem. And it's got lots of suspensory pauses if you want to go back to that. It's got different voices for people if you want to use that too. Um, so let's go on to the sonnets for oh, I think we're going to go into breakout rooms first Pam and just let them explore that poem I think we might need to go into the sonnets because we we've right on eight o'clock when oh, do we finish half past because I've got to be somewhere at half past yeah yeah, right. yeah. all right then. thank <clears> you I think so we can have questions at the end we have more time for discussion at the end all right so we're going back to the powerpoint yes, yes. thank you and the next slide please So I don't know how you find it with teaching students mm -hmm. with sonnets, but I have found when listening to them in exams that quite often I find that they just don't have any idea of the structure of the sonnet. And so looking at the Elizabethan sonnet or the English sonnet, uh, you will know that it has one theme, but there's three aspects possible mm -hmm. in the quatrains, there are the three quatrains. Uh, and Although that one theme flows through, it's important that each quatrain has a slightly different mood or slightly different approach to that theme. So it's important for the student to be able to just, with their voice, show that slightly different approach and that slightly different mood coming through in each quatrain. And then, of course, uh, the Elizabethan ends with a couplet at the end, which is the summary or the resolution of the whole poem. And so your voice there may be a little bit firmer, a little bit stronger because it's the summary and the resolution. And the sonnet should always, because it's lyrical and it's deeply felt, 
uh, it should always be said from a slow to medium uh, volume and pace because you have to be very much aware of the poet's intense feelings. And then there's the Italian, which is one theme, but it's two aspects <coughs> of that one theme. So you have an octave and then a sestet. And the structure of the Italian, in the first section there's the problem or the question is posed. And then there's a pivot or what they call a volta. It was a turn, it's often a word like thus or however. And then you get a new perspective of the whole theme in the second, in the sestet. All right, is that all familiar to you all? Or is that, is that yeah. something anyone would like to add to that? I think a lot of modern ones, though, kind of break the rules a bit, don't they? They do. They mm. play around with them quite a bit. They're still mm. lyrics and there's still yes. 14 lines. Yes. But sometimes they don't have a rhyme scheme. Mm. Sometimes they do, yes, and they can break the mould. But there's still mm. lyric and still 14 lines and still like ambic pentameter. Mm. Yeah, all right. So I'd like to look at the sonnets, please. If you could bring up the two sonnets, please, Emma. Mm -hmm. So, no, this one here. no, not that one. The English sonnet, uh, Where My Love Swears, She's Made of Truth. Mm -hmm. All right, this is Shakespearean <laughs> sonnet, which is your three quiet trains and your couplet at the end. And then the next one, please, which is the Italian sonnet. No. It was previous to that work. That was yeah. above. Mm -hmm. That's it. That one yeah. there. What lips my lips have kissed and where and why by Edna St. Vincent Millay. She is an American poet. Uh, and this is the Italian form of the sonnet. And you'll notice there at the beginning of the sestet, she has the volta thus in the winter, stands the lonely tree. So I'd just like you to go into your breakout rooms and just explore both of those sonnets and then the saying and listen to each other and just see if you can hear the other person having that change of mood after each quite train in your English sonnet and after your octave in the Italian sonnet <coughs> and just listen to each other and just give feedback to each other all right Emma so can we have the yep. I'm just making it so that you can see both room. of them at the same time thank you That's I realized that. that was something that you probably couldn't do before okay can everyone see those roughly good sized? Yep, good. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, right. Let's do the breakout rooms again. See you later. Am I unmuted? There you are. Yeah. Perfect. Good. All right. Thank you. So we're we going on with more sonnets, Pauline. All right. So I just can't see everybody, Pam. Is that? Yep, everybody's back. Everybody's back. I'll just go to Hello, Gary. Oh, I'm on. Oh, yeah, that's, I've got them all now. All right, any comments, please, about how you found that? I think pro probably Gabrielle should say something about Nourish's poetry speaking. It was amazing. Oh. Indeed, it was absolutely beautiful. But we caught, we got cut off halfway through. Oh. <laughs> we were enjoying it so much. She's, it was stunning. Um, so thank you. And we only got halfway through the sonnet, but it was just so beautiful and moving. Which um, one? We were doing the Petrarchan sonnet. Yeah, she's open, if she's open to it, she can do it again. I haven't done it before. Mm -hmm. she was, <laughs> it was beautiful. It and was we, uh, but we, we got this thing saying, go back. So we, we, was, we were stopped <laughs> in this beautiful moment. Never mind. So, mm. Perhaps you might like to share it, Naresh. Not really, no. <laughs> <laughs> what well, you see, I. I was as I was reading it because as I was saying to um the ladies I was working with, I, I work as a psychotherapist, so I'm ah. interested in bringing text into groups because often the voice is folded in and you know exploit themes sometimes through text. And so I'm not trained in speech or whatever. And as yeah. I got to about the fourth line, I thought, oh my goodness, me, they examine people. <laughs> <laughs> They're very kind, very kind. <laughs> no, we just enjoy poetry too. Yeah, mm. yeah, we yeah. really and do. Did you find the people you listened to were able to get those slight changes in the mood for the English and with the Italian or Pitchakan? Yeah. That's I, really good. 
we didn't have enough time to do two. <laughs> no, we didn't either. No, no. <laughs> It went very quickly. All right, so I'd just like to bring up the sonnet by Wendy Cope, and I just ask somebody to try and read that for us, please. Anyone would be prepared to do that? The next sonnet that's at the Wendy Cope. Okay. All I'm right. I'd be happy to give it a go. Thank you. I'm not familiar with this. No, this is a modern mm -hmm. sonnet, of course. You know, Wendy Cope, the English poet. Uh, all right, thank you, Melda. Quite a comedian, really. Well, see, mm -hmm. my sure. glass can't quite persuade me I am old. In that respect, my aging eyes are kind. But when I see a photograph, I'm told the dismal truth. <laughs> I left my youth behind. And when I try to get up from a chair, my knees remind me they are past their best. The burden they have carried everywhere is heavier now. No wonder they protest. Arthritic fingers, problematic neck, sometimes causing mild to moderate pain, could well persuade me I'm an ancient wreck. But here's what helps me to feel young again. My love, who fell for me so long ago, still loves me just as much and tells me so. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. That was I'm not arthritic -y and achy, I can assure you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm in the age range. It's lovely. So that's, that's your an example of your modern sonnet. Uh, yeah, it's lovely. Yes, but it's quite delightful. All right, so now we'll go on to any questions about the sonnets? I think those are great examples. They're very clear in the demarcation between the different parts. They'd be good yeah. ones to use when you were teaching sonnets. Mm. Yeah, yeah, because some sonnets you have to struggle to find. You do, yes. The modern one, mm, mm. they're a bit different, mm. yeah. yeah, mm. yeah. And in modern ones, the poets break the rules, so you, you know, yes. they never quite fit. <laughs> no, they do, and that's quite interesting, isn't it, to find yeah. that yeah, yeah. broken and just their yeah. All right, we'll look at the next slide, please, Emma. Slide eight. Oh, and that's free verse. So now there's free verse, uh, so there's quite a technique, of course, as you will realise, with reciting free verse, presenting it, uh, often has no rhyme and no definite metrical pattern and no fixed number of lines in each stanza. And the line lengths vary to convey the poet's thoughts and the natural rhythm of speech. And each line should take approximately the same time to speak. And the suspensory pauses are doubly important, otherwise the poem turns into prose, which you probably find you hear quite often, don't you? Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll go on to slide nine, please, Emma. And Pam will talk about this one. This is the way that she has found of helping students to understand the approach to reciting free verse. Free verse, this is one way I might say. Yes. Um, but I think if you're thinking of each line has about the same, takes the same time to speak, then you you can be a bit like a metronome, da -dum, da -dum, and you can make, you can do that with your hands. But if you've got a student who's into music, you can discuss that each line is like a bar of music, and that takes the same time to speak. And I, I, you know, a bar of music might have one note in it, and then it has a rest, or it might have ten notes in it, and they're all lots of quick, quick crotchets and quavers. Um, I'm getting my musical notation wrong, but that doesn't matter. Um, but I think if you can look at that in a line of verse, it really, really helps. So a very short line, you might only have one word spoken quite slowly plus a bit of a pause, but you can also organize whether you want the pause before the word or after the word. Um, and I think if you can achieve that, and then you add that imaginative aspect of what the poet's talking about, and the natural thought patterns really begin to emerge in that poem and come through. Um, and there's a poem that I'd quite, have we got time to yeah. have a look at, Perhaps um, we oh, could... that sheet of juniors, uh, the junior poems sheet, Pam? Yes, thank you. Yes, yes. the one about the um, space news. Yes, thank you, Emma. The junior poems. Yeah. 
I won't break out into groups because we won't have time to do that. But if we look at this, and if you, I mean, this is about a, nurse, a nursery rhyme, really. It's hey, hey, diddle, diddle, the cat and the fiddle, obviously. Um, but if you think about the, the line lengths, and you can get a tone of voice that comes through in it, and something like the Space News Agency Atmos report that the sun can be seen quite a lot these days but not very much at night. The spokesman in the moon said, hey diddle diddle, the cat and the fiddle, the cow jumped over the moon. The little dog laughed to see such fun and the dish ran away with the spoon. Venus police have issued identical pictures of the cat and the cow and a dish is being held for questioning. Police have put out a special appeal for any little dog at or near the moon at the time to come forward and help with further investigation of the affair. So you can almost hear the newsreader and the way they, they slow things down coming through at the end. I missed a bit. Of, I have a feeling that pictures should have been on the previous line and because it's been put into columns, uh, it's flipped down into the wrong line. That's what gave me hesitation but it's a fun poem to play around with 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 young people so someone else want to have a go at, at reading a part of it just to to get that that feeling of the the free verse in it no can i try just just the first verse yeah i just like to try and just see if i can slow yeah. those yeah. words on the shorter lines and see if that yeah. works the Space News Agency almost report that the sun can be seen quite a lot these days, but not very much at night. Yeah, it's almost a not very much little poor. I, I'm doing a wee metronome here, which you, you can't see, but, but that it does, you've got to use that imaginative quality in it as well. Yeah. Oh. yeah. So you could slow down those two short lines quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah, these days, and you you can use pauses. You don't have to stretch the words yeah. all all the way either. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think there's lots of ways of getting into free verse. Has anybody got any other ways that they use with their um, with their students to develop the free verse, help develop the free verse rhythm? Well, one way that I have done is to give them um, and say if you wrote the line at a different place what difference would it make mm -hmm. if they should say that word that, that you thought should have been at the end of a line would that have made any difference would it have drawn attention yeah. to something other than what you notice on the page from this one and it's just and shuffle the things around and see yeah. what they, yeah. they may prefer other things but this is what the poet wrote yeah, and it's fine why the poet wrote what he did, isn't it? Yes, and he's drawing attention to particular things he or she wants to draw attention to. If you said, but not very much at night, it totally changes the meaning of the poem. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got to have that at night, because yeah. it's almost yeah. like the punchline of the joke. Yes, yes, yes. Mm. Yes, right. it is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Something else I've sometimes done with, with students, not on that poem, but working on um or perhaps slightly older students working working on a, a free verse poem is to i've got a, a rug in my room and i get them to walk the width of the rug and sort of get themselves going at a normal pace to walk the width of the rug and then try and get each line to oh, fit right. each time yeah. it takes them to walk to the end of the rug and that's that's quite a fun exercise especially when you get three kids doing all doing different poems and all trying to do do their thing but it, it really does it helps them find some fun and it get to know the words but it also gets them thinking about the line lengths and how, it's, how you make it's them a work. poem in voices and mm. it the verse is yellow sun well it, it, if you write down it just says yellow sun yellow sun yellow sun yeah but the way it, it actually is on the pages yellow sun yellow sun yellow sun where oh where will red fox run and it yeah. gets you the stress on different aspects yeah. of that one phrase just by yeah. the way it's set out on the page yeah exactly mm. yeah yeah because lots mm. of william carlos williams does that doesn't he that's it the other one i'm thinking of um 
There's one that's in the list of poems that Pauline sent me that set out like that, Pauline, isn't there? Oh, that Fred Astaire one, oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, the Fred Astaire one. I've got that. Yeah. Yeah. You yes. want to have a look at that? Yes, let's have a look yes. at that, shall we? All over the dance floor. I mm -hmm. noticed that when I was putting them together. Yeah, and it is quite fun. Mm -hmm. Hold on, I'll just make mm -hmm. it a bit smaller. Mm -hmm. So your pauses come before and after the words, depending on where they sit sit on the line. Somebody like to have a go at speaking it. Because it's very much like the dancing that Fred Astaire did. Uh, so you can imagine yeah. yourself doing those dance steps and actually you can get the students to actually move as they're saying that poem and to get those different slow moves and the faster moves. So would somebody like to try it? Helen, you look like you a try on the end of your tongue. <laughs> No, I was looking, thinking, gosh, no, I don't want to try it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to picture Fred Astaire. I can only picture him sort of tap dancing and things. Okay. Um, <clears throat> no, it's not so much how he moves so much, so much as how he stops and then moves so much again all over every, anywhere, all over, so much. Thank you, Mr. Adair, so much. Well done. <laughs> I don't know what dance that was. <laughs> well, can, I, I, can I say, because I actually worked for Fred Astaire Studios at one stage, oh, wow. and, and yes, as a dance teacher, and yeah. it was the Fred Astaire sway, which Helen, you captured. Um, absolutely perfectly um, it was it, it was he was known for that sway and particularly in foxtrot and so forth and Helen actually captured that yes. so well yeah. done <laughs> thank you for that <laughs> that's great yeah. 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 and that last line so much actually has got a bigger gap than that between it uh, on the original copy which will make quite a difference too, because it's a much longer pause before you do yes, this. Yes, 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 it's yes. lovely. So you can actually practice that in your own time, just moving as you say mm -hmm. the poem. And have, fun, and have fun with it. Yeah. And dancing a box trot. Yeah. yeah, and just see what difference it makes to how you say it, because it's yeah. rather lovely. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so any discussions or any questions anybody has about any of what we've discussed tonight? Or anything else about poetry, I suppose. If we can. Or any great insights that you've all got you'd like to share? I'm sure you've all got some. How would you define a prose poem? <laughs> um, that's with difficulty. I've got it in a, in a book somewhere. Um, but it, to me, it is, and I'm thinking of Janet Frame's um, Sunflowers, I think it's called. Um, and it, it's got, there's a definite rhythm. It's almost like, if I say sprung rhythm, I don't mean like Hopkins, but, I, but it, it's it's sort of, it's like the words impel you to go on. There's a need somehow to move on further in the words. Um, I can find it. I have got a description and I could send it. Okay. Post it out. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's certain. And I remember somebody doing it in a, doing not that poem, but another Janet Frame one, I think, in an exam one time. And the, the examiner said, no, there's no such thing as a prose poem. <laughs> they, oh, actually there is. <laughs> we had um, Loneliness by James Brown as a test in yeah. our competitions this year. And that was yeah. a good example was of that a prose, prose poem. poem. Right. And the kids, at first they were thinking, what? Well, for a start, some of them didn't know who Elvis yeah. Presley was. But um, yeah. they loved it, loved it by the end of working yeah. on it. Yeah, yeah. Great, mm. great. Mm. Right. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And very often very poetic words too, lots of lovely imagery. Yeah. Oh yes, but lots of imagery, definitely. Oh. Yeah, the language is very, the language is particularly poetic, but it's it's just the way it, that it's one kind of, kind of, and the rhythm impels you into the next one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think the dreams by Janet Frame might be one like that, Pam. Is there one like that too? Yeah. The dreams, mm. it's called the, the dreams. dreams. Mm. Right, okay. And there is such such thing as dramatic verse too yes that um that people try and there, there's different words that describe them and i think we need to be open to them 
And of course, of course, what comes to mind, of course, is Carolyn, some of Carolyn Duffy's. Yeah. She yeah called, but she called some of her work dramatic verse because it was put into drama, as you know. Yeah. And, and um, I think that's a term that's been used now for a lot of other verse. And it's OK. We get it. It's, mm. it's, it's, it's narrative and it can almost be drama. <laughs> so yeah, yes, so yes, I think we need yeah. to be open to that too. Like yes. some of Browning's, you know, Perfurious Lover and oh, so on. And that's, love, mm. Yeah. 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 Would you ever challenge it. something that was presented as prose uh, poetry in an exam? Sorry? Would you ever challenge something that was presented as prose, as prose poetry? poetry? I would... Just speaking personally, I would ask that student, why do you call it prose poem? Yeah. And ask them to justify it. Mm -hmm. And if they can justify it, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Indeed. As long as you can it's see they can understand yeah. I think the key thing is, is that, well, I would like to think that all New Speech New Zealand examiners are very open when it comes to what is presented to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Certainly that's the intention. Mm. Well, we would like to finish with a poem by Glenn Calhoun. Can you bring that one up? Oh, yes. And this is one of my favourites oh. that I use with it. I have readjusted it even to how to learn lines in a play. So, um, right. So, shall I start? Start, Pam, yes. So it's a set of instructions to be used when reading a poem by Glenn Calhoun. To begin with, Lift the poem carefully out of its paper. Balance the poem in the palm of your hand. Don't be afraid of the poem. Run your fingers around the outside of the poem. Keep going, that's still part of the Is it form. rough or smooth? Is it heavy or light? Throw the poem up into the air. Does it float? Put the poem into your mouth. Either squeeze a small amount onto your tongue like toothpaste into the whole poem into your mouth like cake. Remove the first word and the last word from the poem. Shake vigorously. Each word should fall out of line. Place the words into your mouth and roll them around. Suck, chew, gargle. Hold the words in your cheeks. Spit them at people. When you are finished, put the words back where they belong. Whisper the poem quietly to yourself. Yell the poem out loud. Recite the poem in broad daylight, in moonlight, with the lights on, with the lights off, in the bathroom, in the garden, underneath a tree. Recite the poem on fine days, on rainy days, on calm days, on windy days, or on an empty stomach, with your mouth full. Put the poem on blocks and lie, on blocks and lie underneath it. Tinker with the timing. Pack each word in grease, file off the engine numbers, repaint the poem. Eat breakfast on the poem, stain the poem with coffee. Stand on the poem. Water the poem. Mix the poem in with the washing. Carry the poem around in the po your pocket for a week. Now the poem belongs to you. <laughs> And I just love that poem because for me, that's my whole philosophy in teaching poetry or, or drama or Shakespeare or anything like that, is just to play with the words and, and have fun with them. And see what you, you, you wouldn't say the numbers. I've heard no, people no. add the numbers in. Oh, well, you could. You could. Yeah, I, I just don't. But you, mm. you could, yes. Probably. Mm. I suppose one should. They're there, aren't they? But, yeah. mm -hmm. I loved Sam Hunt's comment when they were talking about poetry in NCEA and how it's not used anymore and it's not relevant and things. And he said that when you got the question, what does this poem mean? Stand up on the exam and recite it out loud. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it means, yes. All right. Well, Isn't thank there a wonderful poem of, um, um, it might be Carol Ann Duffy. She's replied to somebody. They took one of her poems off the syllabus and she, she replied with a very vitriolic poem about, um, you know, the things that you can do with poems. <laughs> I can't remember mm. the name of it, sorry. Mm. Mm. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for being so willing to take part. Well, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And thank if anybody... You. Ha <coughs> Excuse me.